Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me and let's jump into the podcast. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Thank you so much for joining me again today. Please give us a ratings and review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to see a video version, you can go to my YouTube page, White's Cairo. And if you go to my website, drwhites.com, you can find detailed show notes and a complete transcript. Today, our topic is a functional medicine approach to thyroid health with Dr. Ruben Valdez, and this is part two of our interview. In part one of the interview, Dr. Valdez and I spoke about thyroid health, what makes a thyroid misfunction, how to test for it, a lot of the focus was on diagnostics, but we really didn't have much time to get into the particular triggers and how to treat them. And... Uh, with the overwhelming majority of patients in the, in, in the U.S. having autoimmune hypothyroid, um, nor did we get to talk about secondary hypoparathyroid, secondary thyroid, secondary hypothyroidism, or how to treat it. That's a mouthful. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And um, I'd also like to remark that at the time of this recording, we're in the midst of the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic. And so that's providing a background into what's going on. And so uh, I'd also like to ask Dr. Valdez a few questions about that particular topic. Um, Dr. Ruben Valdez is a doctor of chiropractic and an expert in functional medicine. He's the Chief Content and Marketing Officer of Novus Health Systems, a functional medicine franchise. He's written three books, including The Chiropractic Entrepreneur, From Diabetic to Non-Diabetic, and The Thyroid Hack. Dr. Valdez, thank you so much for joining me again today. Thank you for having me, Dr. White. It's always a pleasure. So how is this coronavirus pandemic uh, affecting you and your practice, and how have you been able to um, uh, pivot? Well, I mean, just like everybody, we're being profoundly affected. Um, almost overnight, our entire practice has been flipped upside down. Initially, we got a communication from the board saying, you guys are an essential service. You're working with high-risk patients, diabetics. Then the state said all non, non-essential medical services, meaning immediate response to COVID-19 need to shut down. Then we got another communication from the Department of, of, of Homeland Security saying, yes, you guys need to stay open. So what we've done, we've, uh, we were fortunate enough to be partially set up for virtual uh, consultations, virtual appointments, and we just bulked up that side of our practice. So all of our current patients were um, are being taken care of virtually, just like we are doing right now. Uh, the, this type of Zoom call, we're providing support. We're being able to drop ship um, their test kits, their supplementation, and that's really been quite the blessing. I think I've been busier the last four or five days than I have been, you know, in, in the last three or four months. So I feel really fortunate right now, you know, that we are in a position where we can help a lot of these patients. So currently your practice is pretty much focused on the uh, functional nutrition component, correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. We're a hundred percent functional medicine right now. And so you find Zoom, is that a, a good HIPAA compliant platform? Is that working for you? It, it, it's not perfect, but we're very fortunate that HIPAA laws have become very flexible right now for this very reason. Oh. Um, and there was a declaration on this um, right really at the beginning of, the, um, of, of COVID-19 arriving stateside there was really a lot of stimulus for doctors to go virtual to be able to take care of their patients this way. So right now, Zoom's not a perfect tool. There's some better, you know, like Spruce is a lot more HIPAA compliant, but um, the, the laws around this stuff are pretty flexible right now in order for us doctors to be able to deliver care to our patients. 
Okay. I, I know uh, a number of other people in the functional medicine space who uh, tried to find ways to make sure that they were compliant with all the rules related to, you know, is it okay to treat somebody in another state where you're not licensed and how does all that work? And, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of definitely a lot of laws that go um, deep into that. Our franchise has worked with probably the best legal firm in the country. They're out in California. And uh, normally, you know, these things are very, very strict. If, if it's somebody from another state, you have to have a physical examination to establish a doctor-patient relationship. And sometimes you have to have a local there perform the exam, send it to you. Um, right now, um, I can't really speak into that very much because I don't have anybody um, at the time that would be outside of my state. So I do have a few patients from Florida, from the Charlotte practice, and we've already had the establishment of a doctor-patient relationship in the past. So right now, um, we believe that we're pretty much in compliance within our state laws. Cool. So um, with respect to um, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, Hashimoto's being the uh, cause of uh, overwhelming majority of patients with hypothyroid in the United States is an autoimmune condition. And how does this impact the potential uh, if they contract coronavirus? Are they more or less likely to have a worse response or is it not related at all? Um, we, we know that um, patients who have a um, compromised immune system are uh, more likely to have a worse response. What about somebody with an autoimmune condition like Hashimoto's? Yeah. That's a great question, and I appreciate you throwing me into the hot water of controversy right out the gate. <laughs> That's what we're here for. Good, I love it. <laughs> to try to solve some of these controversies, or at least bring a little bit of light where there is otherwise darkness. Yeah, so here's my position and what I've read. I really can't say on the side of susceptibility to the viral infection I don't feel comfortable enough to have a well-formed opinion yet because number one, this is a completely new virus. It means that none of us have preformed antibodies. So at the end of the day, that really leaves all of us in a place where we can contract the virus. Yeah, I would, I would assume that we're all probably, you know, if we get exposed, the right exposure to the virus um, are probably equally likely to, to become infected. Um, let's just sort of assume that. The question is, is who's going to have relatively mild symptoms and, you know, who is going to need hospitalization? And then you hear some patients just have a horrible response and within a, a day or two, it just overwhelms their body and, um, and takes over. Yeah. So here's, first I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about what I've seen and then I'll talk about the research around this topic. So um, I haven't seen any of my Hashimoto's patients contract the coronavirus yet. I have seen some of my diabetic patients already having contracted the coronavirus and for them it's very, very ugly. Like every diabetic, we know and we consider them to be immunosuppressed because with spikes in blood sugar, you know, there's glycation of white blood cells. And so most of them walk around in a deep or relatively deep immunosuppressed state. Okay, okay. I want to stop you there for a second because I don't think that's a point that uh, is generally uh, talked about or even even considered is we generally think of type one diabetes as an autoimmune condition. Type two diabetes, we generally think of it as a, um, a condition related to um, diet and lifestyle, and, and we don't think of it as having an autoimmune component. But um, can you explain that again? How is type two diabetes impact the immune system? Yeah, so it, it has a huge impact. High blood sugar, when there's excess sugar in blood, um, there's a process called advanced glycation. So these sugar molecules begin to stick to proteins, to cells, and it really decreases their function. So whenever a diabetic goes into the emergency room, 
immediately right off the bat, the, the attending emergency room physician is going to check them off as immunosuppressed. They're going to be treated as an immunosuppressed patient because this advanced glycation affects the function of white blood cells by sugar sticking to the proteins in the white blood cell. And so for many of them, when their blood sugar is high, we're talking above 120 and maybe even lower than that. Um, they have a lot of difficulty fighting off infection. Now, the so, problem so let me just clarify a little bit um, for patients or, or for anybody who's listening, uh, doctors, etc., who aren't familiar with advanced glycation end products. These are AGEs, and these are components of the sugar that com- uh, the the sugar molecules that combine with proteins in the body. And when you measure the hemoglobin A1C, you're measuring um, one of these um, advanced glycation end products, which is where the sugar molecules combine with the hemoglobin. Yeah, 100%. And think about it. And so that's a red blood cell. But now you're saying the same process also occurs in white blood cells. Yeah, it occurs everywhere when there's High blood sugar, think about like the blood becoming syrupy, full of sugar. So that'll stick to the proteins in the retina, in the nerve endings of the retina. There's proteins there in the brain, in the peripheral nerves. It'll stick, you know, in joint tissue. And that's why diabetes, in in renal tissue, that's why diabetes is so diffuse in its complications because these proteins are being damaged everywhere. And so the immune system is no exception to that process of advanced glycation. So um, I've seen it already in them. The infection lasts a long time for them. It doesn't go away. It progresses very rapidly. Um, In addition to that, we know that people that have diabetes or high blood sugar, when they contract an infection, their blood sugar shoots up and it goes higher. Because now there's inflammation, there's more insulin resistance. If they're in a hospital setting and they were just a controlled metformin-based diabetic, you know, a lot of times in the hospital, the standard is to start injecting them with insulin to bring their blood sugar down. Once they go on insulin, then they're put on insulin forever. So it just becomes a very rapidly progressing scenario for them. So I can speak on that side with a lot of confidence on Hashimoto's, I still don't have firsthand experience of my patients contracting the illness. But I do have very, very strong suspicions as to what it's going to look like and how they're going to uh, how they're going to evolve if they contract the infection. It's, it's interesting just thinking about it. Uh, it just so happens that some of the key nutrients necessary for thyroid health zinc and selenium and vitamin D, which are talked about a lot, are also, um, if any of these are low or less than optimal, uh, increase your susceptibility to viral infection. That's right. And to complications from viral infections. And I know that zero patients that have ever walked in through my door coming from a conventional model of care where all that's done for them is taking Synthroid or Levothyroxine, right? None of them come in with like high levels of selenium or high levels of zinc, right? So the majority of these patients are straight out the gate just because of nutritional status in a situation where they are at risk for uh, complications or progression of the virus if they were to become infected, right? So in addition to that, if we go into the topic of autoimmunity, then that really opens up the conversation because I think that... The, it, it's not about the prevention of the infection, but what's going to happen to so many of these patients that already have an, a pre-existing autoimmunity, whether Hashimoto's or lupus, scleroderma, psoriasis, MS, whichever one of these conditions, we know that viral infections are huge, huge triggers of autoimmunity, hands down, rarely any exception to that rule. Interesting, because I, I think that there's a perhaps somewhat misconception that autoimmunity is simply an immune system that's overactive, which would mean that would be a good thing if you had a viral infection, right? Um, You would wish, but not really. (laughs) So, So there's really three main mechanisms 
to autoimmunity in connection with viruses. One of them is called molecular mimicry. What that means is viruses are very, very sneaky, very sophisticated types of infections. And the way that they hide from the immune system is by expressing a protein, an antigen, that is very, very similar to self. It could be similar to the thyroid, it could be similar to the brain, it can be similar to the lungs, depending on the area that the virus is going to infect or it has a preference for infecting. So many times when the immune system creates a response to that virus, if the response is very aggressive, like you were saying, very overactive, then it's going to go after the tissue also. It's going to go after self because they look very, very similar to the immune system. There's also something called bystander, bystander activation, where the immune system, where, where as the virus begins to break down the cells that it's infecting and those cells die and break open, there's going to be self antigens that are released as that cell dies. And that's going to now create uh, a self attack. The immune system is going to identify these intracellular antibodies and begin to go after those tissues because they contain that antigen. And then there's another one called epitope um, activation, which is very similar just to a much larger scale um, to bystander activation when there's very diffuse uh, tissue breakdown. And, and you know when we see things like what happens with coronavirus, this cytokine storm, this huge wave of inflammation to a specific tissue. And so we know that viruses, especially when they take hold, they are very immunoactivating. And there can be a lot of overlap between virus antigens and self antigens. And that's why I, I'm really, really worried for auto, autoimmune patients, Hashimoto's patients, because we know that if they were to contract the virus, viruses, especially very pathogenic viruses, are a huge source of immune activation and that can mean on the least a relapse of the condition a reactivation but on the worst development of now new autoimmune diseases moving forward and i think some of the people that are out there talking about this are maybe trying to bring down the tone create less worry less concern less stress but in reality when you really look at the mechanisms of autoimmunity, this becomes very alarming for the population moving forward, not just for what's going on right now. Now, the things you're talking about, how speculative are they? I could just see, you know, um, the uh, editors from New, New England Journal of Medicine saying, well, there's really no uh, human scientific randomized trials to show that any of this is, is truthful. Yeah, well, they're, they're really not very speculative and they're not too far-fetched. They are speculative for this virus in particular. Right. Because this is a novel virus. We don't have enough data. We don't have enough knowledge. But when you look at, and, you, and, and I've looked at a lot of reviews of the literature linking viral disease and the development for autoimmunity, and we have class one data. We have the best available studies that have shown over and over that viral infections can be very strong triggers for autoimmunity. And so we know that enteric viruses in children are deeply linked to the development of type 1 diabetes. We know that viruses like Epstein-Barr and cytomegalovirus are deeply linked to autoimmunities of the thyroid and of the brain. Those are well, well-documented facts. It wouldn't be a surprise to me that with the type of infectivity and pathogenicity that COVID-19 has um, to the respiratory tract, we, I would be surprised that we don't see long-term autoimmune consequences from this infection. Okay. Cool. Good way to start. Let's, uh, let's pivot to sort of where we left off in the last discussion, and that's talking about the triggers of Hashimoto's and uh, what to do about these. Yeah, so Hashimoto's, really like any other autoimmune disease, has a, a, a pretty extensive number of triggers. We can talk about hormonal surges. If hormones like insulin or cortisol or estrogen are surging, that means spiking day after day. Um, these high levels of hormonal surge 
can be immunoactivating. They can signal the immune system and say, hey, there's too much hormone. What's going on? Is there a tumor in a tissue? Do we need to go clear it? So hormonal surges are big activators. So let's, let's go into that a little bit. Let's talk about some of those hormonal surges. So yeah. why don't we start with cortisol, say? Yeah, so one of the biggest known autoimmune activators, cortisol is secreted by the adrenal glands to, when we are stressed, when we're in fight or flight. And we know that cortisol has initially an immunoactivating effect, but long-term an immunosuppressive effect. When cortisol is uh, detoxified or in the liver, it becomes cortisone, and which has a very immunosuppressive effect. When this st stuff starts compounding, it can begin to shut down some of the areas of our um, innate immunity and start overactivating or driving um, domains of acquired or antibody-based immunity. And so we know that um, stress is one of the biggest triggers for autoimmune, for the development of autoimmune disease and for the relapse of autoimmune disease. Now, what about cortisol having lower levels? Because a lot of us who do like the salivary cortisol um, uh, testing find that um, a lot of patients, especially with long-term stress, just have lowered cortisol levels. Yeah, and for, for me personally, clinically, that's just an indicator that at some point they had very, very high cortisol levels. Now, I'm not very clear on the mechanisms between the immune system and having low cortisol, as clear as I am when cortisol is surging. But, um, but yeah, to me, that's usually an indicator that at some point this person had very high levels of cortisol, and now they're kind of shutting down their production or slowing down their production. Now, I, I can't help but make another comment about coronavirus because unfortunately, it right. seems to be on everybody's mind, including my mind, like 23 out of 24 hours a day as much as I try not to. But right. um, some of the data seems to indicate that non steroidal anti-inflammatories actually worsen your response and, and, and corticosteroids seem to be potentially somewhat beneficial. And um, there, is, uh, there are some articles showing that... Um, uh, glycerizic acid, which is contained in licorice, which helps your uh, adrenal glands to produce more cortisol, may actually be beneficial. Yeah, very interesting and super confusing too, because we know that a chronic stress response reduces your, sorry about that, it reduces your ability to fight off infection, right? That's common knowledge. And right now, the thing that I worry about is people stuck in their house stressed out of their minds, you know, eating all this crap, if they were to contract the infection in my mind, you know, that it, it really creates a negative scenario. So it is confusing to see that um, there, there would be benefit from... Well, it's probably about the timing, you know. In other words, if you were to have a sur surge in cortisol uh, before at the beginning... That might make it work. I, I'm only speculating here based on some of the stuff I've read. But perhaps once you've got the virus that's starting to create this inflammatory uh, situation in the lungs, that can lead to that big cytokine storm that's creating all this damage to the lungs, scarring, et cetera, that sometimes can you know, um, uh, be fatal. Um, and maybe at that point, um, you know, using cortisone can help to lower that inflammatory response. So, you know, it's not always about the, um, uh, the exact um, uh, substance, but at the right, the timing I mean, as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well put, well put. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Absolutely. And in the hospital right now, I know that what they're doing for most people I know a lot of the doctors are not very comfortable yet with the hydroxychloroquinone and the z pack. Apparently, it's a pretty um, aggressive combo, especially for the heart. So I know that for the most part, what they're doing is albuterol, you know, to the lung, which is just an anti-inflammatory corticosteroids. So it makes sense, you know, if if at that point, probably the main thing is driving down inflammation in the respiratory tract. Yeah. So anyway, so cortisol surges that will, how, how does that affect Hashimoto's now? 
Yeah. So we know Sorry that to get you off track, doc. No, all good. So we know that when cortisol um, is surging, it's activating, it's spiking, it can be immunoactivating. It seems that when there, whenever there's a preponderance of, of hormone over time or repeatedly over time, it can signal the immune system to activate. We suspect it's probably part of just innate immunity, the way that the immune system would clear tumors. Um, probably when there's continual surgings of specific hormones, there seems to be signaling to the immune system that there, there, there's a problem with this tissue. And so, um, so yeah. if you have a patient with high cortisol levels that seems to be triggering your Hashimoto's, how would you treat that? Great question. So it'll depend a little bit. Really, we, we like to go three pronged with it. Classically, we'll use adaptogens. Um, whenever we have um, someone that's autoimmune after we've done metabolic clearing, which we like to do with almost every autoimmune patient. And what is metabolic clearing? So metabolic clearing is a combination of an elimination food plan where we remove most of the foods that we know are problematic for the immune system in most people. Which um, would be what? So, <laughs> so it would be... Things like gluten, dairy, soy, grains, you know, um, sugar, obviously, some, some of the key things we know to be very inflammatory and immunoactivating. Okay. Um, and we combine that with um, liver detoxification. We improve nutritional status. Um, we clean out the gut a little bit. And that's what we mean by metabolic clearing. We increase hydration. Uh, significantly to be able to eliminate metabolites, xenobiotics, all of the things that... So essentially you're talking about one of the pillars of uh, a functional medicine approach as originally taught to us by the father of functional medicine, Dr. Jeffrey Bland, using a 4R or the 5R program. That's correct, yeah. So we really like and, um, and find a lot of value in initiating every autoimmune or almost every, there's some patients that won't tolerate it and we can talk about that, but almost every patient that we take on, we like to start them on there because it's such a broad, it covers so many pieces. And one of the things that it does, it helps people eliminate excess hormones during that period of time. So if one of the things is they're having surges of insulin or of cortisol or estradiol, their overall hormonal levels are going to decrease by detoxification. So that's one thing. Uh, another thing is um, we want to induce things that can have a direct effect. Well, I'll tell you what, let me stop you there because we kind of went into the cortisol. Why don't we talk about the surges of insulin? Okay. And what, uh, you know, what we can do about that. Yeah. So those are probably the easiest to talk about because most of the time those are a hundred percent. I don't know why the, this keeps going off. Do, can what you, happened? Can you hear those notifications or am I only the only one hearing? Them? Yeah, I don't think I'm hearing them, Doc. Okay, sorry about that. So um, insulin is a hundred percent connected to dietary intake for the most part. So people that have a diet that's very high in carbohydrates, people that have a diet that's high in starches and sugar, um, people that just eat in excess and eat way more than they should be eating um, are going to be experiencing recurrent insulin surges. Now, if on top of that, the patient has mechanisms of insulin resistance, if they're secreting excess glucagon, if they're having high cortisol, which will also drive high blood sugar, then um, those things can worsen the insulin spike. So initially, we want to also, in the elimination diet, make sure that we're keeping their carbohydrate levels and their sugar intake as low as possible. And then in other stages of the treatment, we're going to go into some of the mechanisms for the insulin surges themselves. Is that clear? Yeah, sounds good. And then uh, estrogen surges. Why would yeah. somebody have estrogen surges? Yeah, so two specific times of life. One of them is um, uh, women that are on the pill for um, for you birth know, control. Birth for birth control. Uh, whenever they consume their 
estrogen, their birth control pill, they're going to have an estrogen surge and they're going to detoxify it, eliminate it. their estrogen levels going to drop the next day. What do they do? They take it again. And so it resurges. And it's interesting because we tend to see when you see younger females, younger adult females in their twenties or thirties, almost always there seems to be a connection to with birth control. And so that's a, a common place where, where you'll see estrogen surges also in so hold on a second so you're saying there's a connection between birth control and hashimoto's yeah yeah and there's a lot of there's a lot of research on that Uh, you just a search in pubmed will show you that um that it's been linked um historically uh, with uh, birth control therapy I so mean, if I, you if you have a patient with Hashimoto's, what is your advice uh, if they're on birth control and you detect that they're having an estrogen surge? <laughs> well, that's going to depend. I mean, if they if they are in wanting consultation to, with their gynecologist, in consultation with their gynecologist, most of the time, like an IUD might be a better option. Um, an IUD. Copper primarily now. Because there's been a lot of problems with some of these IUDs. Correct. There are, you know, and, and there's really problems with most forms of birth control. Then some women um, are might be having really big issues with their menstrual cycle. Um, they might have PCOS. They might have all these issues and they have a lot of bleeding. And sometimes, you know, you know there's a consideration for an IUD with estradiol to kind of offset that. So in, co- in conjunction with their OBGYN provider, I would probably recommend, you know, an IUD, a copper IUD as a preferred method. But I know that's, I mean, you're putting me super in the hot water today <laughs> in, in extremely controversial topics. <laughs> but but um, that would be, you know, um, that would probably be a preferred route. Now, do understand that a lot of people go on birth control and not everybody develops autoimmunity. So there's other factors. There has to be other potential immune triggers. Sometimes there's genetics that are predisposing. And so it's not a general rule of thumb, but if we were to speak generally, we know that this causes estrogen surges and estrogen surges are known to be potentiators of autoimmunity. Okay. Oh, and then, to, and then to add to that, perimenopause and menopausal females also experience estrogen surges during that period. So there also can be, and there is a surge in the demographic information of people that develop autoimmunities later in life. It's, there seems to be a prevalence. And really one of the reasons why I think that this is also so much more common in females than, than it is in males. Right. And, and this is often referred to as estrogen dominance. Correct. And then, of course, we have the toxic forms of estrogen from the environment, like pesticides and bisphenol A and phthalates and on and on and on. Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> we, could, we could spend an entire day there, and, and it's really kind of crazy from even the stuff that's put in food, like estrogen is directly and purposely placed on meat, on food. We are seeing here in the U.S. girls that are beginning to develop um, adult female characteristics, breast tissue, pubic hair, at or around the age of eight or nine, which is unheard of, right? And we look at our European ca- counterparts, most of them um, most of their, their girls begin to develop their female characteristics, adult female characteristics around 12, 13, 14, even 15, which is actually normal. And so the estrogenic load on our population, both female and male, is incredible. It's incredible. So yeah, from toxic forms, from nutritional forms, and the worst part about it is our body could potentially you know, get rid of some of this stuff. But when you throw in all the other chemicals, over 700,000 toxic chemicals um, every day to each and every one of us, the toxic burden is so high that, you know, we really, um, if we're not doing things very purposely, very actively uh, for our detoxification pathways, most of us are vulnerable to this estrogenic bombardment. 
Okay, good. So let's move on to some of the other triggers for um, Hashimoto's. Yeah, so I mean, there's so many I can mention off and then we can go into whichever ones, but there's toxins like mercury, one of the biggest ones, uh, permeability issues in the gut, food sensitivities, um, viral infections, which we spoke okay, about. Okay, so why don't we start with toxins? So okay. we've got heavy metals, mercury. Are there other heavy metals or is mercury the main one that you No, no there's find? definitely more uh, cadmium, aluminum, lead really tend to be the biggest ones. I'm sure there's more, but, you know, those are the ones that I tend to see more frequently. Uh, mercury, two forms, uh, methylmercury and inorganic mercury. Uh, one we get from primarily amalgams in our mouth, unless you were a kid playing with the stuff that was inside of your thermometer, <laughs> right? Which I unfortunately did. And um, yeah, same here, unfortunately. <laughs> and then methylmercury, which we are getting primarily from fish. Um, then cadmium, uh, the main source in humans is cigarette smoke and tobacco smoke. And aluminum, I mean, it's kind of everywhere from ubiquitous. Cans. It's ubiquitous. Um, there's also a form that's rarely talked about, which is copper. And copper is an essential nutrient, but at the degree and amount that we're being exposed to it, it's actually very toxic to both us and our environment. Especially um, since we've switched over to copper piping for a lot of our plumbing. Correct. Yeah. So we it's, went from lead, which obviously is problematic, to right. copper. Which is slightly less problematic, but still problematic. And when we look at the world of cognitive disorders, it's a big, big player in that. Um, and then aluminum, cadmium, lead, uh, mercury. Yeah, I think those are kind of the main ones. Um, that we tend to really pay a lot of attention to. And so the preferred testing, you use serum, is it provoked urine? Is it no. hair? Well, we like to use just for practicality and for accuracy as far as what we've seen. Uh, we like to use Quicksilver uh, trimercury with blood metal. So we run blood metals, but then mercury, because of its... <laughs> It, it really behaves in a way that it's very unique uh, in its differences between methyl and organic uh, or, or inorganic mercury. We like to have the tri test, which will check hair, urine, and blood for mercury. Now, is, is the Quicksilver uh, metals test, is it simply a serum test? Is there some reason why doing the Quicksilver uh, metals test is better than just running serum metals through, you know, LabCorp or uh, doing a nutri valve, which includes serum metals? Um, well, I mean, one of the things that we like is that it's very comprehensive. So it includes a lot of different metals together with um, essential minerals, which are also like metals, things like zinc and copper and all those will also be so. Um, we do it primarily because of convenience. I don't know in that side, in the blood metal side, I can speak into the mercury side and there's definitely huge benefits. To right. Running no, I can see the benefit of doing that trimetals test. Right. Yeah. yeah. But as far as the blood metals, not nothing really that would stand okay. out for me okay. as a preference. It's just the convenience of having all of those metals tested together. Sure. Good. And then when you find the metals, what do you do? Um, <laughs> hey, let's say you have an elevation of uh, whatever, mercury or cadmium or do yeah. you have specific protocols for each one. Is there sort of a general metals uh, detox program you do? Yeah. I mean, again, we, we do like the protocols that have been uh, created by Dr. Shade, um, who is the founder of Quicksilver. Um, and there's differences. You know, a lot of the metals that are non-mercury metals are going to require on top of everything else, they require EDTA to be able to emulsify them and bring them out. Now, if you do EDTA with mercury, you actually push it further into the tissue. So you make the patient worse. Uh, so there's definitely a lot of different specific things. You always want to have a binder that will catch the metal in the gut. You always want to have tons of glutathione and NAC because glutathione has this 
kind of uh, wrapping effect when the metal is pulled from the tissue. It'll kind of wrap it and it'll make it less damaging for cellular tissue as you detoxify it. You also want um, vitamin C, which is going to be immunomodulating as you clear it. You want to have a lot of zinc. You also probably want to do remineralization because as you're pulling metals, you're also pulling minerals, which you want to replenish. Um, what else um, is pretty important? You want to increase liver detoxification. So you want to increase your intake of cofactors and milk thistle and all of the things that help the liver push stuff out. So yeah, you really need a good comprehensive toolkit. So for binders, do you do a, sort of a, a combination binder that has a number of things that are on the market or do you use specific binders for specific metals? Yeah, I mean, most of the time I like uh, activated charcoal and I like kytosan. Those are like my two really big ones. Um, there are some combination ones out there. If they're in stock, hey, it's convenient, I'll use them. Also, um, IMD, which is a very specific gut binder, can also be beneficial, especially when dealing with mercury. What is IMD? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what the letters stand for, okay. but it's just a binder. It's, that's okay. what it's called, okay. IMD. And, um, and it's just a, a little bit more specific for uh, toxins that bind to the lining of the gut. And, and then so, sodium EDTA, what form is that in? Is that, are you, you talking about a nutritional supplement or intravenous or? Yeah, well, we use nutritional supplements. We use it in an oral liposomal liquid, um, but intravenous can be very, very beneficial. And I, actually I've found a tremendous amount of benefits for EDTA and we can talk about you know, breaking down biofilms in infections, um, breaking down, you know, and emulsifying viruses in the respiratory tract, which um, is an interesting application to talk about right now. But um, EDTA is a really good emulsifier. So when things are sticking, it works like a soap to release things. So uh, right. a liposomal form is very absorbable, so okay. we tend to like it. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think what, you, what you're referring to is that um, some infections, bacteria or viruses uh, that get into your system, they may form a biofilm, sort of a protective coating that sort of protects them. And uh, it's more difficult for your body to get rid of it. But viruses, I, I know bacteria do this, but viruses do this as well. No, viruses don't form okay. biofilms, but, okay. vi but viruses can be from, from – this comes from some of the studies around monolaurin and lorisidin. EDTA, okay. um, EDTA has no research um, that I've seen on application, but things that have an emulsifying effect um, have the potential of um, – of removing viral load or lessening viral load and so that's why i think it's very interesting it could be an interesting application to you know kind of play around and don't take this as a medical recommendation this is just a curious mind right. because seeing we we do use it clinically for a lot of uh, sinus infections we'll put it up there with an as, as a nasal spray with things like marcons or very aggressive bacterial infections and it works at emulsifying the the biofilm so my suspicion my clinical interest is that edta could have a very similar effect with viral infections also okay so let's move on to the next trigger for um uh for um hashimoto's we so we we all already covered to some extent food sensitivities insulin cortisol uh estrogen um uh, surges, dysregulation, and we talked a little bit about heavy metals. What would be another common one? Yeah, so a huge one, and this is the thing that everyone talks about, obviously, is the gut um, and increased uh, membrane permeability issues in the gut. 
So, and, and by the way, sorry to keep interjecting, but I, I nonstop, I, I have this coronavirus thing <laughs> on my mind, but I, I just recently read an article that uh, it turns out that a, a more than a, a, a reasonable percentage of patients, I forgot exactly the number, uh, that the infection will actually start with gut symptoms. So it seems to actually get into the gut to begin with. And yep. then obviously somebody who has a leaky gut would potentially be an easier route into the rest of the system. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And out of the uh, COVID-19 prevention and treatment manual, they showed that for some of the patients that were presenting gut symptoms, they showed the value of a high caliber probiotics, something like VSL number three, um, you know, and high levels of like acidophilus specifically is what they talked about in the publication. So absolutely, absolutely. And Would again, you mind sending me a copy of that that I can yeah. put in the show notes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I posted the whole manual on my LinkedIn page. So okay. if you just go to Dr. Ruben, I, I'm happy to send it anyways, but okay. that's a quick way of getting it. Sounds good. Um, so... Um, yeah, absolutely. There's a mechanism there. Um, for those that don't are not familiar with leaky gut in 2020, you should, but, uh, leaky gut medically, that's not a medical term. When we talk to a gastroenterologist or whatever, they call it increased membrane permeability. And it is a thing. It is a diagnosis. Uh, our gut is the only tissue in our body that is one cell layer thick. So it's very thin. It's designed for absorption and filtration. And those cells are held together by proteins that um, gates have like a gating mechanism for specific things that are larger that can be absorbed to be, you know, let's say decided upon kind of like the, the Panama Canal and uh, things can go up to a certain stage and then permeate through or they can be rejected and go back into, into stool and to the bolus. So uh, people that have, gut permeability, increased gut permeability will absorb things that shouldn't be absorbed, right? It can be undigested food particles, which are a problem because just like viruses, some of the surface antigens in food can create molecular mimicry. It can create confusion for the immune system. Um, it, it, lipopolysaccharides, which are these proteins that are produced by bacteria, which are very, very inflammatory, they can absorb viruses, they can absorb a lot of things that are not supposed to go into the bloodstream, creating this chronic activation of the immune system, driving some of the autoimmune pathways. Okay, cool. So um, what do we do about uh, problems with, how do we identify problems with gut health? And then what do we do about them? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of things that drive gut permeability. Uh, one of them, and I rarely hear people talking about this, but it's just the amount of food that we eat and the frequency with what we eat. You know, it's crazy. In America, we eat a lot, a lot and all the time. And what, what happens is every time there's food going through this one cell layer of, of tissue, it's damaging. It's kind of uh, creating, you know, some abrasion. So something that's incredibly effective for leaky gut is fasting, right? Stopping eating the body. We preach this stuff all the time. The body has the ability to heal, to repair itself. So going on a fast, three, five, seven days, 11 days, and something that makes that easier is having something that's densely nutritious, something that has a lot of collagen, something like bone broth um, can be a very, very useful tool for a fast uh, in repairing the gut. So that's one of my preferred. There's also people that need specialty stuff, right? So if we go, if we test and we find that there's a nasty infection like Klebsiella, Clostridium, an overgrowth and imbalance, we need to go in there and begin rebalancing that microbiome, get rid of the stuff that might be driving inflammation, that might be driving some of the breakdown of, of the cell tissue. So how would you handle that? You're talking about using antimicrobials? Yep. Uh, we would use antimicrobials that would be specific to the sensitivity of the pathogen or the dysbiotic uh, fungus or bacteria that we would find. Um, if there is a suspicion of an enterovirus, which 
most of the time, you know, we don't really have a test for, for viruses in the gut, but a lot of people have viruses in the gut. Here's a place where your loricidin and potentially your oral EDTA would also have a great benefit in helping get rid or decreasing the viral load in the gut. So just a, another little tool. And I know some of the PCR stool tests now include some viruses, yeah. a limited number. Yeah, some do. I'm still, you know, I'm still um, interested in seeing um, a little bit more data on PCR, but I think there's a ton of promise there for sure. Um, oh, yeah. We pretty much switched over to using the uh, GI map from Diagnostic Solutions. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. Which is a PCR-based stool test. Um, so next trigger for Hashimoto's, um, what would be the next thing? So, so we did uh, heavy metals. We did um, food sensitivities. We did insulin, cortisol, uh, estrogen. Um, what would be the next one? Yeah, so we can talk briefly about one that's very common but rarely spoken about, and we got into this a little bit the last time, but biotoxin illness. We know right. that 22% of the people, the population, are carriers of a susceptibility in a gene called HLA-DRDQ, and for people that are susceptible, what that means is that their immune system cannot identify or create antibodies or transport um, and present the biotoxin itself. So a domain of their immune system becomes chronically active. Now, um, if you ask the developer of all of this stuff, Dr. Richie Shoemaker, he, would he will tell you there's not enough um, data yet to confirm that this is a driver of autoimmune disease. Possibly. I don't know. I haven't spoken to him in a long time, so I don't know where he's standing right now on this. But clinically, we see an immense amount, an immense amount of people that have these susceptibilities that um, move on to develop autoimmunity. And when they are autoimmune, these tend to be big triggers. So by, by biotoxins, the main one you're talking about is mold mycotoxins? Yeah, mold mycotoxins is the most prevalent one. But there's also Lyme disease, which is becoming more and more prevalent. And, and most people put that in the infection category. Well, it is both infectious and biotoxin because initially when you're bitten by a tick, you get a Borrelia infection. But the Borrelia is a biotoxin producing organism, just like mold or, you know, just like specific types of blooms or just like Marcon's microorganisms, some of them can produce these nasty biotoxins. And so some people um, that are non-susceptible do a great job at getting rid of the infection and getting rid of the biotoxin. Some people that are susceptible can get the infection and they might be treated for the infection, but, but the biotoxin illness will linger on and stay around. And so it, it falls into both categories. Um, and right now, actually, this is a pretty interesting and controversial subject. I, I interviewed somebody yesterday about this because all of us are being forced to stay indoors, right? And for a lot of people, you know, they're, they're now indoors with their other enemy, which is mold, and they don't know about it. And for a lot of people, potentially about 20% of our population, they're going to begin to become sicker and sicker from being indoors. Buildings, um, structures are not built the way that they were once were in the past. There was a lot of focus on air circulation, on being able to move the air from the outside in. And that's one of the things that really can get rid of these biotoxins. Sunlight gets rid, rid of molds, you know, and now people are living in homes, being in buildings and structures that have poor air circulation. So the longer that we are indoors, the sicker a lot of our population and the people that you and I see are gonna be coming back outdoors, you know? Which is interesting, because actually part of it has to do with the construction. Trying to make your home more waterproof ends up reducing the air circulation. Correct. Correct. And then you end up with moisture that builds up within the walls that can contribute to the mold. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's so many, and there's so many little things to that from the way that your windows are flashed 
to, you know, the angle of the roofing. If one little nail goes in the wrong place, it's like, you know, crawl spaces are a problem. Basements are a problem. Uh, sump pumps are a problem. There's so many things that can really contribute, even in the best built home. Uh, this is a problem that, that can really affect any and all of us. And um, so I, I think this is going to have to be our last point. <laughs> uh, no problem. We, we, once again, we're running up against a time clock because um, I do have a patient coming up. Um, so your preferred method of getting rid of mycotoxins and in line? Yeah, so um, mycotoxins or – First thing is removal. So remove the person from the environment that is making them sick or change the environment, remediate the environment. That's Which right now is really hard when you're supposed right. to stay in your house. Right. Absolutely. It's incredibly hard. So for when that can't be the case, there is a protocol. I'll send it to you. Um, there's two things that have been shown effective in killing mold, Formula 409 and Fantastic. Um, nothing else. <laughs> nothing else can kill the stuff. So uh, using that stuff on your house, which is kind of toxic. So I don't know, go to the backyard for a little bit, vacuuming, cleaning, um, all that becomes important. There's also something called air oasis, which can actually uh, kill the biotoxins. It's also effective for killing viruses in the environment too. Um, I, I just, I just had somebody show me a, um, a, an air filtration system that also puts out hydrogen peroxide and they claim that that helps yeah. to get rid of mycotoxins. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're not, they're not hard to kill. Um, so for the time being, that would be the best strategy for Lyme, which you mentioned. Um, the only way of removing the exposure really is if you have the active infection is doxycycline or an antibiotic that'll get rid of the infection. I'm not very familiar with natural methods that can get rid of Borrelia. Um, for, for the toxin, unfortunately, the only binders that we have documented success with are cholestyramine and Wellcall, which are both prescription uh, binders. And these are for the mold? These are, yeah, th this is once the toxin is in the body. Okay, the mycotoxins, yeah. You bind it, you bind it with a binder in the gut to get rid of and it. And those are both prescription meds. Those are both prescription. There is some promise around okra seed and chitosan has the shape where it would bind the toxin, but unfortunately, most of the chitosan out there is not enterically coated. So by the time it reaches the gut, it denatures and it doesn't make it to the bile, whereas where we would bind the toxin. So for the time being, you know, cholestyramine and Wellcall are really the only thing. And I research this all the time. There's some people out there saying that they have a binder that would do this or that, but in reality, they, they are ineffective. And so um, that would be the main thing. And from there, it's a very streamlined protocol where you begin to normalize each one of the immune markers, the C4A, the TTFB1, the MMP9. Uh, there's different steps for each one of those. And ultimately, there's an intranasal spray called VIP, vasoactive intestinal peptide, that will repair the tissues of the sinuses and of the gut. Um, to kind of finalize the whole process. And those are basically part of the Richie Shoemaker protocol. Yes, correct. Okay, excellent, Dr. Valdez. Uh, tons of interesting information. Once again, we could have gone on for another hour, but um, I think this will um, give everybody a lot of things to think about. So for the listeners and viewers, how can they contact you and find out about uh, um, seeing you or um, visiting one of your offices, uh, real or virtual? Yeah. So the best way right now is www.novis, which is N O V I S dot health. So no.com just dot health, novis dot health. Um, that's our main site. We've actually have bulked it up. We're releasing a new site on Wednesday. So uh, we're very excited about that. People will be able to book their virtual consultations right on the site. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, Doc. Have a great day and thanks okay. for all your awesome work. Thank you. <laughs>